Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the geometric distribution and finding its mean or expected value and variance. Now, the geometric distribution in statistics is a distribution that, ha that has a fixed probability of success, P, and it concerns the probability that we'll have to take n trials to have success. And we can kind of capture this best with a tree diagram. So after one trial, there's a probability P of succeeding, at which point we stop, and there's a probability of 1 minus P that we don't succeed. And after that, on our next trial, there's a probability of P of succeeding, and 1 minus P that we don't succeed. And this tree diagram is probably the best way to visualize why. That means that the probability of X being equal to 1 is just P, because that's the probability that we finish it in just one trial. The probability that we take two trials is going to be 1 minus p times p. The probability we do three trials is going to be 1 minus p squared because we're going to go down the 1 minus p branch twice and then multiplied by p at the end. And so it seems that the probability that x is equal to n is equal to 1 minus p to the n minus 1 times p. I'd just like to pause the video quickly to say that the geometric distribution is actually often taken as one of two discrete probability distributions. The one that we're looking at in this video concerns the number of Bernoulli trials needed to reach a success. However, some people take it as the number of failures before the first success, and in this case it would start at zero. In order to look at the geometric distribution that starts at zero, all we would need to do is subtract one from our expected value and leave the variance unchanged because a transformation such as subtracting one from a random variable will not affect its spread. So that means that we know that its PMF is the probability that x is equal to x is one minus p to the x minus one times p for x greater than or equal to one. And of course we couldn't have zero because if we didn't do any trials, nothing's gonna happen. So what we're considering now is its expected value, its mean. And the way we, of course, find the expected value of any distribution is by summing for all x the value of x for its given probability from the distribution. And we just wrote out that the probability of x being equal to x is p times 1 minus p to the x minus 1. Now, p is a constant, it's just a fixed probability, so we can pull that out of our sum. And so we're summing x times 1 minus p to the x minus 1 for all x. And what I'm going to do is just, for the sake of ease, I'm going to let q equal 1 minus p, because now we're going to start to consider how we could evaluate this sum. Well, of course, each term is going to be multiplied by p. When x equals 1, we've just got a p. When x equals 2, we're going to have 2p, and then we're going to have a q. When x is equal to 3, we're going to have 3pq squared. When x is equal to 4, we're going to have 4pq cubed. And similarly, next is going to be 5pq to the 4. And I'm sure you're all beginning to get the idea of how this sum is working. So let's make some space and see if we can do anything with this. Because the problem with trying to sum this is that it's not um, a geometric series. The reason it's called the geometric distribution, of course, is because its probabilities are in geometric series. But this is challenging because it's got a coefficient of 1 here and of 2 here and of 3 here and of 4 here. So how could we deal with those coefficients and make something more manageable? Well, it's all in how we write it out, because this is equivalent to just doing p plus pq plus pq squared plus pq cubed plus pq to the 4, etc. And then doing another sum on top of that that is identical, but just starts one later. And then doing another sum, which is identical that starts one later. And you can, I'm sure you'll see that we would have to continue this out in all directions, forming a kind of triangle over here. But the reason this works is because how many p's have we got? We've just got one. How many pq's have we got? We've got two, we've got three pq squared, we've got, we're gonna have four pq cubes, etc. So it's nicely captured the coefficients. Now, let's isolate each row here. So clearly, this first row here is a geometric series, 
and it was summing to infinity, so we can use a over one minus r. a is our first term and r is our common ratio. So for this top part, we're going to have p, which is our first term, divided by one minus q, which is our common ratio. For our next uh, row, we also have a common ratio of one minus q, but we're starting with p, q instead. And similarly with our next one, we're starting at pq squared, but with that same common ratio. And after that, pq cubed, but with that same common ratio. And so we now have a sum that does look very doable because you'll notice that the sum we have on our numerator is also a geometric series. We're starting with p, we're ending up with our next term is pq, and then pq squared and pq cubed, etc. So we've got p over one minus q as our sum of our numerators all over one minus q, which is p over one minus q squared. And of course, let's not forget that if q equals one minus p, that that means that p also equals one minus q. So this is p over p squared or simply one over p. So this means that the mean or the expected value of our geometric distribution is just equal to one over the probability of success. And if we want to find the variance next, we're gonna to have to remember that the variance of x is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x all squared. So we have the first part that we need to solve for the variance. We just need to find what the expected value of x squared is. And this is a slightly more tricky problem, but it's still one that's doable with the same kind of triangular method. So let's consider what the expectation of x squared is actually asking us to look for. Well, it's the sum for all x of x squared, instead of just the x that we had before, times the probability of x taking that given value. We can simplify this, of course, into p times the sum over all x of x squared multiplied by q to the x minus one. And this is, of course, just swapping p, the probability that x equals x out for p times q to the x minus one. And so let's do what we did before and write out our series to see if we can get an idea for what we're solving. So of course our first term again is just going to be p, our next term is going to be 4pq, our term after that is going to be 9pq squared, after that 16pq cubed, and after that 25pq to the 4, etc. And so it's just the sequence that we had before, but of course all our coefficients are squared, and that's because we're finding the expected value of x squared. But what's going to be really important here with our triangular method is that we need to find something, something that's constant. Some, what is it that compiles and adds in a constant way to form square numbers? It's easy for the integers, it's just one. But what could we use for the squares? And what we've got to make use of is a fact that I'll let you guys perhaps prove for yourself, but it's that the nth square is the sum of the first n odd numbers. But we're gonna use this, this nature of squares to rewrite our sum as follows. So we're gonna have our first row again as p plus pq plus pq squared plus pq cubed, etc. And we're gonna have our next row as multiples of three because of course, each square after the first one will need the next odd number added to it to form the next square. And again, skipping our second uh, column this time, we're going to add the next odd number after that, which is of course five. And if you want to verify this for yourself, feel free, but this is successfully generating all of the squares in a predictable way. It means that what we're now summing is this first infinite series here, which we know already is p over one minus q, plus this next series here, which is three pq over one minus q, plus five pq squared over one minus q, and etc. going along like that, with just the odd numbers as coefficients. And this is something that's much easier to capture within a sum within sigma notation. The first thing I'm gonna notice is that one minus q is equal to p. 
So every P that we've got here, we can just ignore because P over one minus Q is the same thing as P over P. So we're really just looking at the sum one plus three Q plus five Q squared, etc. And we can capture this as a sum with the sum from N equals one to infinity of two N minus one multiplied by Q to the power of N minus one. And of course we can expand this bracket and distribute leaving us with two times the sum from n equals one to infinity of n q to the n minus one minus the sum from n equals one to infinity of q to the n minus one. Now this sum over here should look very familiar. We know what the value of this is. It's one over p squared because we calculated it before to find the expectation which means that this part over here is simply equal to two over p squared. And equally, we know what this is equal to as well. It has a first term of one, and it has a common ratio of q each time, which means that it must be equal to one over one minus q, or in other words, one over p. And this means that the expected value of the square must be then equal to two over p squared minus one over p, or in other words, two minus p all over p squared. And so we're now in a good position to finally work out what the variance is, because of course the variance is the expected value of the squares, which is two minus p over p squared, minus the square of the expected value, which is one over p squared, giving us a variance of one minus p over p squared. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I think it's really interesting being able to use what makes up the squares to kind of break down sums or kind of expand them out into more understandable concepts. And I think this kind of like triangular method that we've used is particularly interesting as well. And we've actually used it before on this channel to evaluate the sums of sums on a particular integral video involving the floor function. So I hope you guys have enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Bye.